Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a junior doctor working in Cambridge. And in this video, I'm gonna be combining two of my favorite things in life. And I'm gonna be explaining some of the vaguely medical slash scientific scenes in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Let's just jump into it and take a trip down memory lane. Sorry about that. So, Hagrid. Uh, Hagrid in the books and in the, in the films is famously a half giant. And I suppose the closest medical slash scientific correlate to that is two conditions. The first one is called gigantism and the second is called acromegaly. Both of these are caused by excessive growth hormone, which unsurprisingly is the hormone that makes you grow. And that's secreted from the pituitary gland, which lies somewhere in the middle of your brain. Now, some people will have something called a pituitary adenoma, which is a benign tumor that grows in the pituitary gland. And if it's the right sort of cell type, that can release an excess of growth hormone. So if Hagrid existed in real life, he'd probably have the childhood version of it called a gigantism. And that makes you grow really, really, really tall. So people with gigantism can be between seven and nine feet, according to Wikipedia. And the reason that is, is because when you're a child, your bones still have the ability to grow. So if you imagine a bone, it's like a long stick. And at the end of it, you've got your kind of fist bits of the bone. But in between those two bits, there's something called a growth plate. And when you're young, your growth plates are where all the growth happens. So it's like as you inject growth hormone and as time passes, the growth plate expands and allows the cortex of the bone to grow. Whereas the growth plates fuse by the time you're an adult, which means you can no longer get any further elongation of those bones. So instead, if you have circulating growth hormone excessively, you tend to get the growth in the face, in the hands and in the feet that grow with a different process. Maybe some of you have come to Hogwarts in possession of abilities so formidable that you feel confident enough to not pay attention. Mr. Potter, our new celebrity. Tell me, what would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Okay, so this is an absolutely iconic scene, the first time Snape and Harry famously interact. And there's actually quite a lot of scientific slash medical stuff that's going on in this scene, so I'm gonna try and break that down. So firstly, Snape asks, what would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? So what do these mean? So firstly, asphodel is a plant, and it's often associated in Greek mythology with Hades and the underworld, so we've got some kind of dark connotations there. Back in the day, it used to be thought to be some kind of cure for snake bites, and even more interestingly, it it actually used to be classified under, under the family of lilies before it got its own classification. And it gets even better because wormwood is the common name for the plant Artemisia, which is probably named after Artemis, who is the goddess of the forest and the moon. And we'll come back to those in a second. But a common symbol that's been associated with the goddess Artemis in mythology is the deer. And as you might know, both Snape and Lily's Patronuses are does, which are female deer. And in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, when Harry is chilling in the forest of Dean, he comes across the doe, which is the Snape's name's Patronus, on a moonlit night. And if we make things a bit more medical, uh, the plant wormwood, i.e. Artemisia, is where we get the substance artemisinin from, and that is the active ingredient in a lot of anti-malaria drugs. And this was discovered by the Chinese scientist Tu Yu Yu, who won the 2015 Nobel Prize in Medicine. So in this very first thing that Snape says to Harry, we've got firstly a reference to Lily Potter, secondly we've got some foreshadowing of events to come, and thirdly it's actually got some legit medical reference behind it. Well, let's try again. Where, Mr. Potter, would you look if I asked you to find me a bezoar? Okay, so a bezoar in, in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the book, they explained that a bezoar is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat. And in the world of Harry Potter, it's got the power to cure poison. And Harry famously deploys it twice in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Firstly, to show off in Slughorn's lesson when they're trying to build this fancy potion that Hermione gets really pissed off about. But secondly, Harry uses the bezoar to save Ron's life when Ron drinks the wine that Malfoy was trying to send to Dumbledore but ends up in Ron's hands. Anyway, so bezoars are actually real things. Um, it's a term given to any trapped mass within the gastrointestinal system and you can get loads of different types of them. Uh, they're caused by a buildup of certain food substances. So for example, within milk, there's a protein called casein and that reacts with the gastric acid that you get from the stomach and that can form a certain type of bezoar stone. So the question is, do bezoars actually cure poisons in real life? And there's mixed evidence. So on one side, we've got an experiment that was done in 1575 by the French surgeon Ambroise Paré. So his cheeky little experiment was that he found a cook who was a cook in the king's kitchens and who was trying to steal some cutlery. And apparently back in the day, the penalty for stealing cutlery from the king's kitchen was death. So this cook was gonna be hanged, but Ambroise Paré managed to convince the guy to drink some poison instead of being hanged. 
so he drank some poison, and then Ambroise fed him a bezoar stone and hoped that it would cure the poison. Unfortunately, it didn't, and the guy died in about seven hours after ingesting the poison. Would have been quite a slow and painful death. But that N equals one study sort of showed us that bezoars don't really cure every poison. But on the other hand, we do have some evidence that bezoars can remove the toxic component from the poison arsenic. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So firstly, arsenic contains the ion arsenate, and the ion arsenate looks quite similar in its chemical structure to the phosphate ion. And the phosphate ion is used in loads of different processes in the body, but the most famous one is glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose into energy, and we need phosphate for that. If you've been poisoned with arsenic, then you've got this arsenate ion floating around in your body. And therefore, when your body is trying to glycolyze glucose into energy, or ATP, instead of using the phosphate, it uses the arsenate, which means you get fewer molecules of ATP, i.e. energy, produced. And eventually, if you can't produce enough energy from glucose, then eventually your body is gonna be starved of energy and you're gonna die. But this is where the bezoar stone comes to the rescue because bezoars have phosphate within their crystalline structure. And if you put this bezoar in a solution containing arsenic, then the arsenate ion in that solution gets swapped out with the phosphate in the bezoar. So you're inactivating the toxic arsenate by replacing it with phosphate from the bezoar stone. So long story short, um, in some cases, perhaps bezoars might be useful in inactivating certain types of poison, but they're definitely not the catch-all magical cure that they were purported to be back in the day. And apparently back in the day, bezoars used to, used to sell for lots of money because people believed they had these magical healing powers. Unfortunately, the evidence <laughs> isn't quite there for those just yet. And what is the difference between monkshood and wolfbane? I don't know, sir. Okay, so this final part of Snape's assault on Harry is what is the difference between monkshood and wolfbane? And in the book, he explains that monkshood and wolfbane are the same thing, and they are other words for the more common plant called aconite, um, which is actually a real plant. It's a poisonous plant, and from it, we get the toxin that's called aconitine. And aconitine is very interesting because aconitine is able to bind to voltage-gated sodium channels that we have everywhere in our body, and sodium channels are absolutely essential for the conduction of nervous impulses down our nerves. So what aconitine does is that it binds to the sodium channel and causes it to stay open. And because nerve conduction is based on the influx and efflux of sodium and potassium and other, other ions, the problem is that if your sodium channels are staying open, you don't have the ability to regulate the influx and efflux of sodium ions, which means you cannot conduct an action potential down that nerve. So this means that your nerves don't work, and if your nerves are not gonna work, then you're gonna lose sensation and motor control of pretty much every part of your body, so you can die from that. But also, voltage-gated sodium channels are intimately involved in the generation of the cardiac action potential, i.e. it's the generation of the electricity that makes your heart beat on its own. So if your sodium channels get poisoned with monkshood and wolfbane, as Snape calls them, you're not able to generate a proper cardiac action potential, which means your heart doesn't beat regularly like it should, which means you can go into what we call a ventricular arrhythmia, i.e. where the ventricles, the big bits of your heart, are not pumping properly, and then you can die because of lack of blood flow to all of your, well, to your brain and everything else. So all three of these questions that Snape has asked Harry and that Harry's <laughs> unable to give the answer to, these are all associated with poisons of different types. But the cool thing about that is that they've all got some kind of basis within medical science. Of course, here it is. Nicholas Flamel is the only known maker of the Philosopher's Stone. What? Honestly, don't you two read? The Philosopher's Stone is a legendary substance with astonishing powers. It will transform any metal into pure gold and produces the elixir of life, which will make the drink for immortal. Immortal? It means you'll never die. I know what it means. All right, let's talk about the elixir of life. And this actually takes us into a really exciting field of medical and scientific research into prolonging life and reducing aging. And unfortunately, this is an area of research that not many people in the general public are very familiar with. Now, there's this amazing YouTube channel called Kurzgesagt that you should definitely subscribe to. I'll put a link in the description, but here is a clip from their video introducing this concept. Getting old currently means spending more time in pain. So scientists are trying to shift the attention of the medical community from optimizing lifespans to optimizing health spans the part of our lives during which we're disease-free. To do this, we need to attack the root cause of almost all bodily defects, aging itself. So that's a bit from their video. You should definitely check out the rest of it, and I'll include some other links in the description if you're interested in getting an introduction to this whole idea of aging and why we should fight aging and how we can fight aging. But in, in, in the olden days, this whole quest for the Philosopher's Stone used to be called the Magnum Opus, which is Latin, I think, for the great work. 
So like hundreds of years, hundreds of years ago, people realized that actually this whole thing about aging and death did not have to be the inevitable thing that we now take for granted. And I think it's very interesting how we're all very happy to pour billions of dollars into these massive fundraising campaigns for things like heart disease and cancer, but also millions of dollars into very rare genetic conditions that affect very few people. And yet so few people, relatively speaking, have thought about contributing to anti-aging research. Because if we can cure aging as a disease, then we wouldn't need to worry about heart disease and for, for the most part, cancer and Alzheimer's and dementia. These are all diseases that tend to be strongly associated with aging. Going back to Harry Potter, that's sort of what the elixir of life is. It's trying to cure the process of aging. And that's how Nicholas Flamel, our friend from the Philosopher's Stone, who recently featured in the Fantastic Beast film, uh, survived for that long. Drinking the blood of a unicorn will keep you alive even if you are an inch from death but at a terrible price. Okay, for the record, this unicorn blood thing probably isn't real. There is some kind of talk about how maybe we can do blood transfusions into older people from younger people, and that might help combat aging. But again, the evidence is very, very sparse for that. And I doubt that's what JK Rowling had in mind when she talked about unicorn blood being used to sustain life. You'll get Gryffindor into trouble again. I I I'll fight you. Neville, I'm really, really sorry about this. Petrificus totalis. All right, so Petrificus totalis has a couple of vaguely medical things that it could possibly relate to if Harry Potter were real. Uh, the first one is uh, a, phenom a phenomenon called rigor mortis that you might have heard of, and that is the third stage of death. Uh, the first stage is pallor mortis, and the second stage is algor mortis. Pallor means you go pale, and algor means you go cold. But in the third stage of death, you go rigid. And if we look on the scene, we, we also see this like blue sheen appear on him. So maybe that's a reference to the coldness. We also see him looking quite pale, but then he is quite pale anyway. There are also a few diseases and drugs that can cause uh, muscle rigidity, like what happens to Neville. You can get these things called upper motor neuron lesions, which are diseases that affect certain parts of the central nervous system. And that can be things like strokes or brain tumors or hemorrhages or spinal cord injuries. And it's the interplay between the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons that causes our muscles to be able to move. And it's the upper motor neurons, i.e. the ones in the central nervous system, i.e. the brain and the spinal cord, that provide an inhibitory effect. So if we have a problem with our upper motor neurons, i.e. a problem with the brain or the spinal cord, then it's only the lower motor neurons that are able to function. And therefore you get hyperactivity of the muscles, so you get rigidity. And there are also some chemicals that cause this type of muscle rigidity type effect. Probably the most famous one is a poison called tetanus toxin, which is the second most potent toxin in the world after botulinum toxin. And what tetanus toxin does is that it makes you get this rigid type of paralysis. And the way it does that is that it gets into your bloodstream and it targets a protein called synaptobrevin and cleaves it in half. Probably not in half, but it cleaves it in some way that inactivates a synaptobrevin. Synaptobrevin is a protein that's involved in the release of the neurotransmitter gamma amino butyric acid, also known as GABA. Now, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which means that much like the upper motor neurons that we just talked about, it inhibits, it stops the muscles from being overactivated. So if you get tetanus toxin into your body, you don't get synaptobrevin working. Therefore, you get less release of GABA from your inhibitory neurons. Therefore, it causes your muscles to become hyperactive. So that's kind of what's happening to Neville in Petrificus Totalis. You're a great wizard. You really are. Not as good as you. <laughs> Me, books and cleverness, and more important things, friendship. And bravery. There is nothing medical in that at all. I just think that's a really, really nice and cute part of the film. Feels strange to be going home, doesn't it? I'm not going home. Not really. All right, so that brings us to the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. That was a breakdown of some of the vaguely scientific slash medical scenes within Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Big shout out to my friend and colleague, Dr. Ed Hope. I'll link his channel down below. He does really good breakdowns of all the medical signs within things like the Marvel films and anime and stuff like that. So you should check that out if, if you enjoyed this kind of video. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, then please consider doing so. I usually make videos about medicine, tech, education, productivity, that sort of thing. So if that's up your Diagon Alley, you should definitely hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.